Well, to develop personalised therapy in ovarian cancer really has been a long-term goal. And until recently, we were not able to do this because we haven't been able to identify uh, factors in the tumour that allow specific targeting of therapy. What we now have is in BRCA-related tumours an opportunity to exploit a deficiency in cell repair, in DNA repair, um, in those tumours by a process called homologous recombination. So these BRCA-related tumours can't repair their DNA properly and rely on other pathways, particularly pathways that are, um, are affected through the PARP enzyme, the poly ADP ribose polymerase. So blocking that enzyme with an inhibitor of PARP, such as the drug Olaparib, uh, in those cells leads to a process called synthetic lethality and cell death. So we have a highly specific personalized therapy uh, with PARP inhibitors in those BRCA deficient uh, ovarian cancers. So my talk on personalized medicine really focused around the development of PARP inhibitors and specifically Olaparib, which is the drug that has uh, really uh, the first, first leading drug in, um, in this field. Uh, to be licensed um, for the treatment of ovarian cancer. Well, I think that now that we have a drug that um, is active in patients with a BRCA mutation, we are going to have to change the way in which we practice by testing more women for the presence of a BRCA mutation. In the past, we've relied specifically on uh, family history as being an indicator of the likelihood of women having a BRCA mutation, but we now know that many women who carry a BRCA mutation do not have a family history of breast, ovarian, or indeed other cancers. Uh, and when we look at uh, high-grade ovarian cancers, we find BRCA mutations in around 20%. So what that really means is that for us to be able to treat as many patients as possible, we will need to test all women for the presence of a BRCA mutation. And that opens up all sorts of problems not only in the way in which we uh, talk to women about this and uh, counsel them, uh, but also how we link in with the various genetic departments in our country and indeed around Europe, all of which function in a different way to be able to test these women um, and see whether they're suitable for the drug. What we've seen with the PARP inhibitors is that they are specifically active in patients with a BRCA mutation, but we know that the defect underlying all this homologous recombination repair deficiency is actually more widespread than in tumors that have a BRCA mutation. So I think the next step, and this is happening with some of the other PARP inhibitors such as Rucaparib and Niraparib, is to look to see whether these drugs are active in non-BRCA related tumors that express HRD and that means that we have to develop tests for HRD. So I think that's the, the next area of development we're going to see. But beyond that, some of the what I call second generation trials are now starting in which PARP inhibitors are being combined with other molecular targeted agents, particularly antiangiogenic drugs. There was a very interesting um, and provocative trial presented a couple of years back at uh, ASCO from Joyce Liu and colleagues in Boston combining sidirinib, which is a VEGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, with Olaparib in women with platinum-sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer. And what that showed was that the combination of those two target agents not only led to um, a very good response and improved progression-free survival, but in a retrospective subgroup analysis, the uh, benefit of those two together seemed to be better in the non-BRCA mutated patients. So this has really spawned a, a, a series of trials across the world looking at a combination of a variety of different PARP inhibitors with different antiangiogenic drugs. And I think that these second generation trials, which uh, will go on over the next three to four years, um, are really very exciting developments.